Hey guys, Dylan from Kalama Performance Australia here in the beautiful Hood River with Dave. How are you? Good. There's <laughs> 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 always a blue part. Do, do I need to do that too? <laughs> now I can go. <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, we'll start again. Okay. <laughs> On. There we go. <laughs> That one comes from Johnny. <laughs> All right. So, Dylan Henry here from Kalama Performance Australia with Dave Kalama. We're in the beautiful but hot Hood River. Uh, last week we both completed M2M. Yep. You completed a lot quicker than I did, but it was a hell of an experience. Um, for me, as my first time doing that crossing, to, to experience the whole thing was absolutely incredible. Do you still get that same? feeling when you go and do it or no and yes and by that I mean I don't get nervous anymore and I used to get nervous when I would do channel races um, because I've gotten to the point where I'm, I'm not worried about my result anymore mm. whereas before I mean if I got to the starting line there's only one thing I'm thinking and there's only one result I'm after yeah. And that carries with it a lot of intensity, um, a, a lot of stress. Yeah. And I know that position is no longer on the table for me. And so that reduces the stress, mm -hmm. it reduces the intensity, and now I can start to enjoy just doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm competitive by nature. Yeah. I'd love to be up near the top, but part of my preparation now, because I can't prepare like I used to, which means miles and miles and miles of paddling and foiling and riding my bike and whatever it might be, now it's more mental preparation because I don't have the time to do the physical preparation. Yeah. And so I've got to manage my expectations. And in other words, I've got to get rid of all expectations and do it for the fun and try and maximize the enjoyment that I get from doing it and so that completely changes my approach yeah like I say I'm still competitive I want I want to get out there and mix it up but I can now absorb being on the starting line saying hi good luck have fun to my fellow competitors and mean it yeah yeah. Not not as a courtesy or formality. Yeah, I hope you do good. I'm going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what was going through my head before. Yeah, yeah. Now it's not. Yeah, so did you get to enjoy the run and do a couple of turns and stuff? Or were you sort of more... Oh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, and that's why I say I don't get nervous anymore. So no, that intensity isn't there. Mm. But the enjoyment is as high as it's ever been. Because I have the ability to be a hundred percent present and absorb it all and realize how special and unique it is and that familiarity with being in the channel it's everything to me now like like being there doing it the level of comfort I have out there it feels like home it feels familiar and it's incredible to to do it, just yeah. to do it. And I'm sure you felt that on some level where being out in that much water, and even though there's a lot of other people doing it, a lot of times you find yourself truly alone. I was so alone for a lot of that race. And it was, because we haven't had much time to really catch up about the whole experience, we won't go into it too much, but I had a shit of a start and my legs were shaking, I was out of breath and I went into the negative. Straight, like straight away, I can't do it. I should turn back. I'm not going to make it. And I was just like, no, like, get out of that headspace. You know how to paddle up, get up and go. And when I got up and went, I still crossed a couple of people I knew and overtook some people and got overtaken by people. But for 85% of that race, I was on my own. Yep. And I had my boat behind me, which was that, my safety net. But it was, it was pretty cool. I, I think for the start, well, I've never been, I've never raced a foil really before. Um, 
doing the, the circle with the, how do you pronounce it, the puwau, the shell horn? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, they did this, the shell horn thing, and the full body shivers, and they blessed the ocean, blessed the land. Right. That for me was almost a highlight. That was to be a part of that culture. Like it's that was super special for me. And then to do the crossing, like it was when I got to the end, I was just like, oh, yeah. I did it. <laughs> it's you're at the start, and there's this intensity, and everyone's excited, but they're nervous. And there's another island off in the distance, and there's a lot of water and 27 miles, and so it feels it can feel very daunting and overwhelming. Mm. And if you approach it like like you have to take on the whole thing, it it can be stressful and it can be overwhelming. But if you get to the start line and you get on your board, and you're on your board, you're not on your buddy next to you or yeah. Kai's board and wondering what he's thinking and what's he going to do and what's his line going to be, yeah. then you're not on your board. Yeah, you're not in your bubble. You're not, yeah. You need to be in your little zone, in your board and be present and just 100% be there and pretty soon 27 miles is 20 and then it's 15 and before you know it you're halfway and then you're like, no. I don't want it to be over yet, you know, because yeah. you can see the finish line yeah. coming up, and it's it's such an amazing feeling. I I so encourage people to to do that race. Um, if you're even slightly thinking about doing a long downwinder or getting into it, and, and yeah, it's called the race, but put it put it on your list of things to do somewhere down the line. You will not be sorry. Well, that's what I said. Like I asked you and. Uh, Jeremy, what should my first one do? M to M, and I was, and like those nerves, oh, I was legitimately shitting myself for weeks <laughs> going into this. Like even Johnny said to me in the airport, he goes, "Do you all right?" And I'm like, "This is in Sydney." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm all right," kind of thing. And then t till the start line, stress. But then when I got out away from that stress, and I was just foiling. Yeah, I was in my bubble downwinding, and like. As I said, I wasn't racing, I just want to do it for experience. I'm going back next year. Oh, yeah. I'm doing it again. And I might be a little bit less nervous because I know... You know what to expect. I know what to expect now. And I'm going to paddle or get my boat to the start line. Yep. On time. <laughs> um, but let, let's talk about... So that, that event as such, for, for me to come from Australia to Hawaii, be there amongst everyone. There's a lot of great athletes from around the world. But for, for me been a barracuda rider and seeing just the amount of barracudas uh, production ones but then pre-production um, was out of there was 45 sup downwinders I'm gonna say it's just over 50 percent of them were barracudas what's how does that make you feel considering you've basically pioneered downwind foiling for all of us to enjoy and then you've created this board that's taken the whole industry forward as such to see all your boards in the lineup. Like, how does that make you feel? Because, like, for me, being the importer and, and sponsored by you, I, I was, you know, sort of like, how good is this? But how does it make you feel? You know, that's a that's a really it's a really complicated. Um, feeling I have about that. You would think the obvious is, oh, well, you've got so many boards on the beach and so many people are using them. You must be stoked. And yeah, there's a there's a part of me that absolutely uh, is happy about that, and it, and it makes me feel like I'm accomplishing something. Um, but it's just, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because. I'm a very small manufacturer in the scheme of things. I'm competing against Goliaths. And I'm literally David. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> and so I like being the underdog. I like to feel like I've got to fight to get what I get. Yeah. And that's what's gotten me where I am. 
Yeah. And so, to, to, I wasn't even at the beach that morning. I stayed in my escort boat. And, Why did they even think you were coming for some reason? Oh, <laughs> I sort of have a thing of getting away from all the chaos and being in this yeah. calm place and really being tranquil in my preparation. And so I just did what I always do, kind of avoid all the, the, the chaos yeah, and the hype. The cameras in your face and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I did the same thing with that, so I didn't see it myself, but yeah, I get satisfaction from it, but I feel like I've become the R&D department for this entire downwind foiling industry, and that's frustrating if I'm being honest. I'm not the R&D department. I'm trying to create something for me, my brand, and, and people, my customers, mm. you know? Um, and and to see all of that hard work and, and information and passion, um, time, just consumed mm. and taken for granted by a lot of people, um, is frustrating, you know. And and yet I wouldn't have it any other way, yeah. because better they copy me than I copy them. Yeah, I agree. And so no matter how many boards I sell, whether I sell one or 100,000, I'm going to keep that mentality that I am literally David, I'm fighting Goliath, I've got to outwork, I've got to outthink, I've got to out everything if I want to get my place in this world, right? And so that's important for me to keep me motivated, um, to keep me passionate about what I'm doing. You know, I have had so many people that are authorities in this industry basically write it off mm -hmm. from day one. I've heard they're beginner boards, so I was surprised at how many beginners there were at the beginning of the race the other day. 50% I've, were beginners. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard... You can't turn them. You can't turn them. You can't pump them. You can't ride in small bumps. You can't ride them with small bumps. The only thing they're going to do is, is go through the water faster and everything else is going to be shit, right? Yeah. And now you look at everyone is creating a version of the Barracuda. And so regardless of how I feel about that, it tells you if they work or not. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. The whole industry doesn't turn on a dime if something doesn't work. Because it, it almost happened, it almost feels overnight, doesn't it? It was, it was... From the outside, it might look like that. Yeah. But, but that dime, I've been working on for like the last five or six years. Yeah, yeah. You know, and making real headway in the last two to three years. Yeah, the last two to three for sure. Because it's it's coming up to twelve months that I got my Barracuda, and it's you can't beat it for what we do in the ocean downwind and stuff. And, and I've had the opportunity to ride different well, versions of your Barracudas of, that you've been working on. It's and it's just where well, you're going and taking it. It's just well, back to the double-edged sword thing. If if I'm going to get all this credit for creating the Barracuda, I'm probably my biggest adversary in that I was the one chasing the shortest boards for a while, mm. thinking that was where we needed to go, and performance was based on how short of a board you could ride. And so I bought into that belief and, and pursued it heavily, mm. you know, and had production boards, production stand-up boards under five foot, yeah. you know? So that that tells you how big a swing you can have depending upon what your focus is. But at that point, my focus was performance and turning and aerials and carving this and that and the other. And then I realized if people can't get up on foil, it doesn't matter how high performance the board is, it, it doesn't matter if you can't get up and ride it. And so my focus shifted from high performance turning to efficiency, yeah. which coincided with my building passion for downwinding 
And when I realized that the whole key to downwinding is efficiency and getting up on these small little bumps, then it's you know, my, my focus and my attention went 180 degrees the other direction, right? So, um, you know, I kind of went from one extreme to the other. But that that's was been, that's a function of what my focus was. That's been said before too. You, you're either one extreme or the other. Yeah. So it's, but things well, don't change unless you know if you st if you stay in the norm, things don't really change. You actually have to step outside and push it to that level, right? One of the luxuries of being a small company is I can play on the fringes yeah. and take more risk. Yeah. These big companies can't do that. Yeah. They will literally go out of business. If they make a bad decision, yeah, because it's I can survive a bad decision because then my numbers are so much smaller, mm. right? And my whole business is predicated on my passion for this industry, not the money I'm making. Because if, if it was about the money, I'm one of the stupidest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making enough money to make this about the money. Yeah, it's passion. I've got to enjoy it, and I really enjoy it, and that is why I can design things so much further on the fringe combined with some I guess you call it intellectual or emotional evolution where I stopped worrying about what other people thought and their judgments and that's really what took the guardrails off of my design conceptuals conceptually and went I can do whatever I want I don't give I don't care what anybody thinks anymore so start trying some wacky shit. Just on that, I just thought about it then was, have you made a, so with the, there's been an evolution of the Barracuda, like different versions of it. Have you made a board for downwinding that you've completely scrapped? Like have you made something and gone, no, nah, it doesn't work? I can't say I've made something and totally scrapped it because I think everything has something to offer. Yeah. But I have definitely found that some of my uh, beliefs or or my design concepts did not work how they I thought they were going to yeah. and so in that sense there were times it worked better than I thought it was going to yeah, okay. and then there's definitely times where it worked worse yeah. and this is not what I was looking for but okay if you take the time to analyze why it doesn't work and try and figure out you can use that information well, okay, if, if, if the water is interacting with this edge or with this contour or this profile, then that means this. And if this is true, if I do this, it should feel this way. So you move on to version two, right? Yeah. And if the result is consistent with your theory based upon the wrong design, now I've learned something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so that helps towards the evolution of getting to where I want to go. So even what you might call a failure is really the opportunity to learn such valuable information, sometimes even better information, because when you get it right, you just tend to think, oh, it's me. I'm no, really good at this, yeah, yeah. you know? And you don't take the time to analyze why. Mm -hmm. And the why is where the gold is and where the information is. And, and Nobody gets it right 100% of the time. Mm. In fact, I've, like I just explained, those failures are the opportunity to learn the most sometimes and, and then design around that new information. So R&D for you is mainly Maliko, would you say? Or do you, like, there's a team, there's, you have a, it's mainly <coughs> you, but there's a team around you that you bounce off for different feedback. Um, what would you say that for a board, to become a production board, that what's, what's the R&D process for you? And then they're sort, sort of compared to what potentially you, like others are doing. Like you're a shaper who shapes, rides, comes back, drawing board, shapes, rides, comes back. Like, can you sort of briefly- Trial like, and error. I mean, that's literally what trial and error is. Yeah, right? yeah. To, to create something that's perfect, you know? Well. Somewhat perfect. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's it, can, it can always get better, and that's yeah. sort of the goal is to always make it better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just but so what is the process? The process is first me 
having an objective and most recently that objective is to create a board that makes it so easy to get up on foil that almost anybody can do it. Yeah. And so with with that as being the target, now let's start the trial and error process. Here's, I, I take all these beliefs and these experiences I've had throughout my 37 year career on Maui and okay, from windsurfing, water interacted with the fin or the rail like this and from toe surfing, from canoe paddling, just all these paddle boarding, right? Um, and try and build off of all that information that I've experienced. You know, I've often said I have zero formal training when it comes to hydrodynamics, but I would have to be near a doctorate in practical experience yeah. when it comes yeah. to hydrodynamics. Um, and so while you can get the math right on a computer and by the numbers you have potentially the most efficient foil, board, whatever it might be, hull design, um, when you bring in to the equation the human element and skill, I don't think there's a matrix that literally can represent that variable. Because you're, some people are incredibly skilled. Some people are incredibly not skilled, right? Yeah. Everyone's got their parameters and their abilities they're dealing with, but you're, you're trying to fit them into a design or a board or a shape, dimensions, whatever it might be, um, that works for them. <coughs> so, first is the objective, trial and error. Once I think I've got something that feels better than anything I've had, now it's, just, it's a matter of confirming it and getting the team rider guys, like yourself, try this out, tell me what you think, you know? And I, as much as I can, try not to cloud their opinions <coughs> with, oh, it, sh it should feel like this, or acting too stoked, or kind of bummed, or whatever it might be. Mm. But trying to give them a, a blank, uh, sort of neutral point to start from, and let them form their own opinions about it, and then talk to them after the fact. And then those team riders <coughs> and mates and people who have them, they're on multiple foil brands, are they? Yeah, excuse me. This dry air up here is a bit... <laughs> oh, it's really dry air. Um, up in the mountains. Yeah, it, it doesn't do me any good to only have people that use GoFoil or Axis or whatever it is. I, I need to have people try it that use all brands to help me figure out where the boxes go, to help figure out if the characteristics of the board are somewhat in harmony with with their style, their foils, whatever they might be, right? I mean, for the most part, board and foil, you can figure out how to make them work together. But you, you need to verify that and yeah. just make sure. <coughs> and so, if I, if I get the kind of response wow, that was cool, that worked really good. And you, you can pick up someone's level of stoke. Mm -hmm. And they don't even have to use the words um, that I want to hear that kind of articulate certain things. Just their energy level, Yeah, I've gotten pretty good at picking up on, and that tells me a lot about how stoked they are yeah. or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's really valuable information because no matter what they say, if I'm picking up, the energy's not there, then I know, all right? And if, you know, five people, six people later, I'm getting the same message, it's like, okay, back to the drawing board. Yeah. You know, let's get back to work. But if it's the other way around and everyone's like, oh my God, I can't believe this. This is amazing. You know, after about the fifth, sixth person, you start to think, hmm, okay, maybe I am onto something. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> That's cool. It's, it's, it's good to get your insight on how that process has, has worked. But, um, well, you know, you're, you, no matter how many team riders or people you trust, and you don't want all really good foilers, because yeah, really to, good foilers can make anything work. Yeah, exactly. And right. that doesn't help you either. Yeah. You need some average Joes that really good equipment is going to make a big difference. Like, for the flat water thing, for example. Yeah. yeah. 
there's a very specific point at which you know if your technique or your equipment is working or not. Meaning, you get off the water or you don't. Yeah, there's right? water splashing around, you're pushing water. And if someone has been trying for two or three weeks, four weeks, whatever it might be, and they're kind of on the verge, but they're just not getting there, and you introduce a, a different board into that equation, and that's the only variable you've changed, and all of a sudden they pop up off the water, yeah. that's a really, really good indication that what you've created or what you're trying to achieve is working. Yeah. Whereas with someone that's really good, it wouldn't matter if you put them on a 4.6 or an 8.6, they're going to get up they, off they the water. It's up. not a make or break for them. Yeah. But for some people, the efficiency of that board is make or break, literally, yeah. if they're getting off the water or not. So to me, those kind of results are almost more valuable than the high-end guy that doesn't need that level of efficiency to get off the water. Yeah, that's good. <coughs> well, um, I think we'll wrap it up there on that one. But, um, yeah, good to catch up. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you, Dylan.